Oh, dude, we lost Derek. Hmm. Uh-oh. Derek just said, I've had enough. <laughs> really? I just had to be in the office. Derek just said, I've had enough and left. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I would really uh, am excited to have uh, uh, the four of you with me today here. Uh, my name is Damir Marusik. I am uh, the executive editor of uh, the American Interest Magazine. Um, I have an excellent panel here today to talk about uh, a grand strategy uh, for China. It's a subject that has been kicking around um, quite a lot around Washington, D.C., and uh, all of you have been grappling with it in, in your own ways. Um, before I introduce you all, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome all of my uh, friends and colleagues uh, at the American Interest, uh, including our editor-in-chief, uh, Jeff Gedman. Uh, who's been really a force of nature in getting us to do more of these sort of online events, especially now during this, uh, this time of, of uh, COVID, and our publisher, Charles Davidson, uh, without whom, honestly, none of this could take place. Um, I'd also like to welcome our broader audience on YouTube, uh, who are watching on YouTube Live, and please do avail yourself of the, uh, the question box on the side there. Uh, ask questions. It's showing up here on my screen, so I can definitely uh, get your questions to our panel. Um, I have uh, with us uh, Giselle Donnelly, uh, who is the resident fellow uh, for Defense and National Security at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, Giselle's written a piece uh, that sort of prompted this, uh, this discussion, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, I have Andrew A. Mikta with us as well. Uh, he is the dean of the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies. Uh, just need to note that Andrew is here speaking in his own capacity. Uh, his views are his own, and they do not reflect uh, the views of the Marshall Center, uh, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. Uh, we have Dr. Sarah Kirchberger, who is the head of uh, Asia Pacific Strategy and Security at ISPK, a think tank in Kiel. And uh, Mr. Derek Scissors, who is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, Giselle, let's start with you. Um, uh, you wrote a piece for us, like I said, last month, uh, and we, we titled this talk uh, based on the piece, The Shape of a Real Grand Strategy. Um, again, I thought it was a very timely piece because while everyone, I think, agrees at this point that we need to be thinking about these things uh, in, uh, in terms of how we, we, we face up to China, no one's really gone through the paces, and I think your piece was one of the the first pieces that we've run at the magazine that I think in, in, in big detail gets into how to think about these things. Uh, so uh, why don't you kick us off here for this conversation, say a few words, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take it from there. Uh, my pleasure, Demir, and uh, thanks for, for setting this up. Um, yeah, I mean, your opening remarks were very apropos. Um, the pandemic in particular seems to have uh, brought to a head um, at least the genuine or general understanding that uh, the rise of China is problematic, to put it mildly. Um, and in particular, uh, that the nature of the Chinese regime is, is pretty different uh, than uh, ours in the United States, or even broadly throughout the liberal, uh, the liberal West, the global liberal West. Um, and that there's an underlying conflict there that isn't going to go away anytime soon and uh, you know, sort of puts us at loggerheads. But there's been much less conversation about the sort of so what uh, part of that proposition. Uh, certainly not in any um, you know, sort of comprehensive way, anything that could actually be called a how-to strategy. And even though the, the piece you referenced, you know, clocks in at 7,000 words or something like that, it did seem like sort of a hop, skip, and a jump kind of effort to paste together at least a framework for discussion, which I'll go through very quickly now, but I really would like to defer to my colleagues to sort of help flesh out um, uh, what, what that might mean. There was a very, still is, I suppose, a very unfortunate uh, U.S. military acronym. Uh, these things are always more a bar to understanding than they are a prod to understanding. And this acronym was DIME, D-I-M-E, for Diplomacy, Information, 
uh, military power and economic power, sort of as though as though they were interchangeable things, and uh, you know, um, equally tools of government. So while the framework has extremely uh, has its limitations and shortcomings, and it's not maybe a bad place to start uh, in organizing our thoughts about what the government can and cannot do, and what. Uh, civil society cannot and can do to uh, uh, to defend our regime, so to speak, and to ameliorate the consequences uh, uh, of this conflict. So beginning with uh, diplomacy, what I proposed is, again, not, nothing particularly new about this, um, is a revital revitalization of uh, America's Eurasian alliances. Um, those have been the traditional means uh, for us to project power and to consolidate what we, I think are still allowed to call the liberal international order. Um, and it has a sort of glorious Spikeman-esque uh, uh, aroma to it that makes it sound a lot fancier than it, than it probably is. But it does sort of remind us that at least from a North American view, this really is a global problem uh, and requires us to operate in multiple places on multiple fronts with multiple partners. Um, we do have the luxury of having done so very well in the past, but this administration, actually let's, let's say that the past two administrations have not been particularly interested in making the effort to, to keep this stitch together and we've gone from sort of indifference to animosity uh, during the Trump years. Uh, uh, you know, even though Donald Trump has uh, discovered that uh, Xi Jinping is maybe not his friend, um, it's still much more fun to kick Angela Merkel around than it is to, uh, and uh, Xi Jinping is likely to kick back, um, at least directly. So again, sort of repairing these alliance structures, these strategic partnerships that have been the framework and it uh, helped us to more to make our whole much greater than the sum of our parts would be. Uh, strikes me as the first thing. So, so, so it, let me. Yeah. You know, I mean, just to 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 uh, focus on this. I mean, I think that yeah. the really the really strong part of your essay is that I think you, you you make the case that for me reading the essay, what what jumped out at me is what what a a, a uh, uh, what an effort this will entail, right? I mean, yeah. it's it's the liberal order is uh, in many ways has been, I think, eroding. I think you, you point that out very well in a lot of ways. I mean, a lot of it's been taken for granted. So it's the thing that jumped out at me is the kind of recommitment to trade and then a recommitment to rearming. I mean, is that, is that, a, is that a fair sort of... Yeah, uh, and I, I think a, a recommitment to, to taking up the um, uh, cudgel of ideology or, the, the, or re, uh, uh, you know, inventing the power of our own ideology our alliances are not so much based on sort of, you know, uh, blood and soil. Our whole country is, is uh, uh, sort of a political principle uh, made reality. So if we were to keep these alliances intact, there has to be something that holds us together more than um, ties of kinship or tribe or, or nation. So and what we sort of have to hit on all cylinders at the same time. Um, and while, you know, in some areas we're better than other, I think the Trump administration deserves some, uh, you know, some credit for, say, calling into question the idea that uh, neoliberal uh, economic order has some downsides as well as some positive. You know, it does make people rich, but it leaves a lot of people out. And uh, certainly, as we've discovered um, uh, during the, the COVID crisis, uh, having such a critical reliance on Chinese supplies uh, is, is, like I say, it, it results in uh, plentiful, inexpensive goods, but it has strategic consequences. Yeah. Uh, so, and I would particularly turn to, to Derek here, uh, but the, the analogy that I sort of dredged uh, from my past work is to remember the British Navigation Acts and the navigation system. 
uh, much embraced by Alexander Hamilton at the founding of the Republic. But the idea is basically that politics precedes profits. Mm. Um, and that establishing free trade among free peoples, as I described it in the article, was something that, that we could do. I, look, I'm happy that sort of having tossed out this uh, uh, construct, I'm happy to have it ripped apart now. Well, uh, actually, but if it's uh, for illustrative purposes, I no, can uh, withstand it. That's, that's, I think it's a great uh, jumping off point. Andrew, uh, you've written for us uh, several times on this subject, um, and I think, you know, uh, at least, at least in, in, in my knowledge uh, at the American Interest, I think you, you've, you've, uh, you've done a lot to, to popularize and I think bring into the lexicon the whole concept of decoupling. I, I, you know, we, we talk about this often at the magazine that I, we really do think it, it came from you. So um, can you then talk a little bit about, uh, pick up where, where Giselle just uh, left us off. You're thinking about what does, you know, uh, rethinking what globalization might look like. And uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. How do you? How do we talk about the economy? How do we rethink what's still necessary of trade to keep alliances together, and yet learn from our mistakes? What does that look like? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And again, <clears throat> my compliments to Giselle for writing a very interesting piece. Uh, and I will try to highlight a couple of points where where I am in violent agreement and where I disagree, and and bring this to the discussion of what I called hard decoupling. Uh, first point, if, if those of you who have, who have uh, read what I've been writing over time, I have been a critic of globalization as construed over the last three decades for at least the last two decades. Uh, not because I am not a believer in open liberal systems driven and built by free people, uh, where everybody benefits, but because what was considered globalization over the, these last three decades was essentially, uh, on the one hand, uh, free trade uh, ideology from, from our side, which brought a tremendous amount of offshoring of our supply chains. This in and of itself is not even such a, a horrific issue from my perspective, but how the Chinese have played throughout this game. Uh, you know, on the one hand, you had the ideology of, of free trade, Everybody wins the end of history, the, the new liberal international order in 1989, which I consider in history to be one of the most fundamental misreading and the kind of triumphalist uh, uh, chutzpah-like approach to, to the implosion of the Soviet empire uh, and a number of things that follow from there. And the Chinese approach to this, which has been hardcore mercantilist view, you know, the, the notion that export-driven modernization would get the Chinese to become a responsible stakeholder, if you will, in the international system. I cannot tell you how many goofy conferences I've sat through when this was repeated ad nauseum, uh, while all the evidence uh, to the contrary was unfolding before us. Um, this, this essentially has brought us to the situation where we are today, which, uh, which means that we're facing not one, but two aligned on fundamental issues, aligned near peer competitors. And granted, China is a pale shadow of what the Soviet Union was, but in the military domain, if you look at it in the context of Europe having almost completely disarmed over the last two decades, the balance, balance of power on the Eurasian flank of Europe is extremely disconcerting. And on the other hand, so you've got a, a power Russia that wants to revise the post-Cold War international settlement. And in, in Asia and Eurasia, and in the Indo-Pacific in particular, you have a, a Chinese state that wants to revise, not just revise, but replace the existing international order. Uh, and by allowing this to continue with the, this kind of amount of vast economic, technological, knowledge-based transfer, where, where quite frankly, often, I'm not saying this lightly, but greed was masquerading as ideology, uh, the, the kind of transnationalization of manufacturing supply chains. What we've ended up with is not only do we not have a, a China as a responsible stakeholder, but we actually have a very geostrategically assertive, uh, highly, highly ideological communist China. I, I will remind the audience that 90 percent uh, strong communist party basically runs a state of a, a billion point four uh, people. Uh, and most importantly, we have resulted in, in a very radical centralization of supply networks, which means that in a crisis like COVID, we find ourselves unable to provide for some of the most fundamental supplies in place. So uh, just kind of as an opening statement, uh, 
I agree that the, that we need to reinvigorate the West and we need to pull together. We need to provide a vision of a new international order that we would like to, to, to create. And we have to convince our publics, especially, that that order will be superior to what we have been pitching them or, or the elites have been pitching them for the last 30 years. And then we have to outcompete China while limiting the damage. And, and just let me say these two things, which are extremely important. Uh, we are beyond the point where we can contain Chinese power, especially when it comes to the military. Uh, so we need to outcompete the Chinese and hear the role of Western governments in launching a series of programs in terms of basic research and development, new systems development has to be essential. And, cont and, and, and the uh, limiting the damage piece is, as, as my relatives in Tennessee say, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Uh, if we are looking at the devastation that the Chinese access to every level of our society has brought, uh, we have educated their weapons designers, we have created basically their educational system because these kids who have been coming to our universities for the last 30 years have in effect built a premier university system in China right now. And we have allowed for an amount of corruption that Chinese money has brought into the Western system. This needs to stop. That unrestricted access to our Western open societies has to stop. And we need to build a cohort of people who can actually understand China. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Sarah, you are uh, both uh, a sinologist and our, our, our European uh, uh, member of the panel here. And so I, I think you, know, you can take this any uh, which way, but what I'm hearing, um, and you know, it's both in Giselle's piece and, and uh, what Andrew's uh, mentioning before, um, is, is the importance of, of, of alliances. And um, what always ends up coming up, at least in the, in the discussion in Washington, it's almost an obsessive area of, uh, of focus, despite the fact that the Trump administration doesn't seem to pay that much attention to Europe, is really how is Europe looking at China at this point? So maybe uh, you could start us off by talking about that. Uh, again, it, within the context of what we're talking about, that you know, facing the China challenge would require um, uh, a strong you know, recommitment to a, at least a transatlantic alliance, and again, beyond that as well, we need allies in the Pacific as well. But uh, please, go ahead. All right, thank you, Damir, and thank you for, for being here. It's a pleasure. And um, yeah, I, I'm happy to offer some some uh, views from Europe here. And what I would like to point out, um, a lot of the grievances against China that Andrew has already mentioned are also being perceived in Europe in various quarters. But uh, China has been very successful at presenting a different face to different parts of the world. So Americans often do not quite understand that Europeans have difficulty wrapping their heads around the idea that China is actually a military threat, because from their point of view, it's the other end of Eurasia, Taiwan, is some small island that doesn't really matter or something like that, in, in the view of some people. No, please don't uh, don't uh, quote me as saying that. I've, I think Taiwan is an extremely important island for various reasons. But the thing is, Europeans often see China as this um, trading partner, this important economic partner. And China, to be fair, has been showing Europe a much different face than it has shown the United States in terms of being very nationalistic, militaristic towards the United States as its main military competitor, whereas Europeans have been treated differently. So it's not not to be wondered at that there is a difference of perception but during the past few years there have been a market have been market changes in that perception there have been many many individuals and they've been talking with each other and com uh, comparing their experiences um, which were quite bad in some cases in terms of authoritarian influencing and attempts to to shut down people like a colleague from France, Valérie Niquet, who was sued by Huawei for speaking out on French TV um, against, you know, employing Huawei technology in 5G. So now she has a lab lawsuit to, to grapple with. So these kinds of things, they kept piling up. And I remember in particular one conversation that I had with a Chinese colleague who lives in Europe. And I was throwing out all this frustration at him, like you're doing this and you, you guys are doing that and it's not okay. And his reply to me was, Sarah, it's absolutely not a problem that we are trying to enforce our national interest. The problem is that you are letting it happen. 
And this is really the point of the whole issue, in my view. So we have been sleepwalking into a situation where many European countries have become completely dependent in some cases, or almost dependent in terms of, of economics, on the Chinese market in some areas, of course, not in all areas. And uh, this is really a, a difficult position to be in, as Australians also know. It's, it's the same situation, basically. So what should we do? I think we have um, the problem here that the transatlantic relationship has been going downhill for various reasons. At the same time, we have a difference of of appreciation of the facts, a difference of opinion on China. So we, we need what we need to do is we need to do two things. We need to find out what's really the truth behind all these perceptions. Europeans need to wake up to these military security problems that the Americans are facing in the Asia Pacific, whereas the, uh, the Americans might might want to listen a little bit more, perhaps, to some of these voices in Europe that say, we understand you, but there must be some place for China in a new world order. We can't, you know, wish for them to suddenly disappear from the from the earth. It's not going to happen. We need to deal with China in a constructive way. So there needs to be a positive vision for China as well. So this is something that maybe should also not be neglected. And then, uh, of course, what we need to do is we need to repair this rift in the transatlantic relationship. This is really a dangerous situation if it goes downhill even further. What can we do? I think it's almost like a, a relationship that has gone downhill. Relationship counseling might be in order. We not, might need to think about how to treat each other. And just giving you one perception from Europe that comes up all the time, um, it, it really is hard. As uh, Giselle already mentioned, if, if uh, an old, long-standing ally is being called an enemy and then at the same time a murderous dictator is said to be a love affair you know almost in the same breath and this is really something that it may just be said tongue-in-cheek but people in Europe really find that disturbing so these kinds of words they do a lot of damage they undermine the long-standing trust and trust building up trust takes ages but it can be destroyed in a minute. So we need to be careful with that. And it goes both ways. Europeans too need to be careful about how they treat the, their American partner in terms of rhetoric. So this will be a, a little bit of a starting point. And I'm happy to, of course, discuss with, with all of you what could be done further. Wonderful. Um, Derek, uh, let me pull you in on this. Uh, we're focusing now early on a little bit more about uh, you know this the uh, the trade element of maybe building some of these alliances. I, 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 it's a, something that's that's run through most of the comments this morning. Can you can you talk a little bit about um, what is properly realistic uh, about uh, you know for for a, a kind of reshoring you know uh, decoupling approach on the West? What's possible? Um, what are the potential costs? What are the kind of adapting strategies? Uh, you know, go ahead and run with that, however, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take it from there. Oh, Derek, you're muted still. Probably bet that I was muted, uh, but now you've, you've opened the door. Um, I, I wanna point out that Giselle invited me here. So when I say I disagree with all of you, it's her fault for letting me speak. Um, trying to answer your question and make the point about some disagreement uh, as the person who focuses most on economics in the group. Um, I don't think the system of alliances we had in the year 2000 is going to be the one that effectively counters China. There's certainly no economic reason to believe that. And so people looking backward at the alliances we used to have are, I don't think, being realistic about what will work in countering the threat that I think all of us here and probably most people listening agree exists. Um, I'll try to make a couple of points to that effect and, and touch on your you know, question about economic decoupling. That is a big question. I have a 6,000 plus word paper and growing in progress addressing how to do that from the American side, much less everybody else. Uh, but I'll try to touch on it. So the first thing to, to you know, show that I read uh, Giselle's piece, because um, I, I like to prove that before I attack something. Um, she correctly labels the TPP as an economic plan with, with a uh, greater strategic purpose. And the problem is it didn't really have an economic purpose. Um, and I could go into detail as to that. Uh, and I, uh, the question I posed to the Obama administration at the time when they were asking, why don't you support this is, I don't think we can have 
trade agreements, in quotes, that are strategically driven, not economically driven anymore. I don't think that's possible in the U.S. right now for an extended period. I'm not sure it's possible in some of the other countries that I'm familiar with. Um, I, I think when we take strategic steps that exacerbate or, or don't address economic weaknesses uh, and we sell them as positive, which we've done in the past, this is fool's gold. Um, and to, to get to Giselle's point, which you also touched on earlier, um, if we attempt rearmament without curbing entitlements first, it won't work. Uh, you know, we can be, we can pretend, we can claim that we're going to do this, and this isn't a great idea. It won't work. Uh, that is not a feasible U.S. economic response. Um, with regard to getting a little closer to to decoupling and supply chain movement, there's a quote I, from the paper. This is why I keep looking over here. Subordinating the profit motive to, to strategic direction will have costs, not just in lost dollars, but in lost liberty, almost surely greater corruption. And I think that's been mentioned by other panelists, either directly or, or indirectly. And I agree. Um, but we have the corruption right now. Uh, we have a lot of corruption. If you, I, I think everybody here knows it. But as someone on the front lines of dealing with U.S. economic policymakers, there is a lot of systemic corruption. I don't mean people getting money handed to them. I mean thinking that their economic interest is the U.S. national interest. Um, and that, again, I think that's been referred to by other other panelists. Um, the goal of cutting, I, which I have and I've had for six years, I started writing about decoupling in 2014, economic decoupling. The goal of cutting China out of supply chains um, involves recognizing that some of our previous allies won't do that. They are lost. We will not be able to set up supply chains, including them, because they will be either unwilling or unable, that is an important element of this, of cutting the Chinese out. If you take a strategic good that involves a supply chain and you want a zero China content requirement, you're not going to be able to include all of our former friends economically. And I can, I can prove that if we had a lot more time and you wanted to have a lot of data thrown at you, because the world economically is very different than it was in the year 2000. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. I have some specific points about debt traps and 5G, uh, but I'd rather have a, a conversation with the panelists and the audience. Uh, terrific. Um, Giselle, um, I think uh, Derek gets at, at, something, at something really, really important about this. I mean, again, the, the thing that I both appreciated and both sort of uh, took my breath away about your piece is how ambitious and how, how much needs to be done to get the grand strategy together. And uh, can you react a little bit to, to Derek's points there about uh, both the impacts on potential allies and alliance structures. I mean, I think you, you make the point that we're not looking back, we're trying to look forward, and yet still we, we're relying on, to a large extent, NATO. Uh, you, you make a case for uh, recommitment to the greater Middle East as well, and, and Asia Pacific and what, what collective uh, security looks like there. And a big part of that, you make the case, is trade and creating some sort of you know, uh, argument for that. So can you react a little bit to that? Yeah, sure. With the, first of all, with the general defense of overreaching, you know, so if you overreach by a ridiculous amount and fall short still by a ridiculous amount, you've made progress nonetheless. So um, as that, that is my you know, blanket defense uh, of, of being overly ambitious. Um, and look, this is a testable problem. And of course, the alliances are going to be founded by, or around or organized around a different set of problems and a, and a different uh, set of challenges. So, of course, they're going to be different. But our giant advantage is that we are already a global power. China needs to become a global power, wants to become a global power, is trying to become a global power. So, simply, and so we have relationships to protect relationships that are now becoming a, a greater drag on us than they are contributing to, to solutions. So simply, uh, you know, trying to repair, that, fix that problem so that the relationships and the alliances that we already have don't become a, a greater burden than they sort of have become in the last couple of years. Just, you know, again, it's this, Andrew's stop digging, uh, 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 Point, uh, but uh, applied more broadly, and 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 you know, I, uh, again, I would just think that for two important reasons, even kind of an, um, you know, if searching for a complete decoupling from China 
is is probably not realistic and, and possibly not even to be desired. But being able to have strategic competition in the context of continued trade of, of some sort is more like what history has, you know, the great power competitions has been like one way in which the Cold War was so so different and so unique. Uh, the rise of Germany uh, was uh, you know, took place in the context of really interdependent international trade, and that was the case of Bourbon France and Habsburg Spain uh, as well. So there ought to be a way to balance these things and achieve a greater balance of these desiderata uh, rather than the sort of pursuit of um, uh, especially the sort of in the context of a, a, a trading relationship or you know sort of the asymmetric trading relationship with a geopolitical adversary and it's not like you know trading with with Germany or uh, Japan, which has its asymmetries as well, but this uh, is in the context of a of a strategic competition. So you know we ought to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And I think that you know offering some incentives to partners to um, you know at least uh, and and Beric is probably right that there are some who are simply incapable of doing it without you know, suffering. A domestic collapse of some sort, uh, and we have to be tolerant of that too. I mean, we still have to practice statecraft uh, in doing this. But um, again, I do think that first of all, we have a system that we've inherited, and we need may need to transform, but not, we can't just discard entirely and ensure that that works to our advantage, not against us. China has the advantage of picking spots and picking on weak members of the herd, uh, you know, the weak wildebeests uh, 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 of this planet. And um, again, we need to raise the costs of of doing that. Uh, no, again, I, I I think your your piece is is incredibly important that it it you know keeps that in mind. It's 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 very sort of again, uh, sets the scope for what's required. Andrew, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, you, uh, you have talked about the importance of the military dimension on all of this. Um, at the same time, I think what, what Derek has brought up about the, the, uh, the costs involved, the, the kind of uh, trade-offs that need to happen domestically, I, there's many ways to ask, ask this question. I guess, let me put it two ways. One, uh, how optimistic are you uh, about us being able to make the military commitment that, you know, again, I think Giselle does a very good job uh, showing how, how much this undergirds the ability, you know, there's the trade component, but also undergirds the, capili uh, the ability to, to um, guarantee, uh, to do security guarantee. So how, how how capable do you think we are of doing that given cost constraints? And a different way of asking the same question is how high a priority should it be? Is, is now uh, military investment, if you were advising an incoming president, say this is the top thing that the United States should do? So I'm betraying my <clears throat> particular bias here and what I work on all the time. But I, I would make the first point as follows. Uh, we're paying the price for, again, the 1990 uh, kind of ideological certitudes and triumphalism uh, and the belief that somehow, uh, with the implosion of the Soviet empire, some very basic things that informed our elites when they thought about strategy for decades no longer applied. So we had the end of history, we had the unipolar moment, we had the institution building, we got it area studies at our universities is a pathway to tenure. Uh, people who, who have designed these grand schemes and projected how China would become whatever it was going to become, a stakeholder, all this other nonsense, uh, probably couldn't put a coherent sentence in Chinese or understood Chinese history, uh, but the institutions were going to trump everything. Um, we have allowed for national security priorities to take uh, second place be behind the ideology of globalized free trade. In the meantime, we have also pursued two decades 
of incessant warfare that has eaten up resources to an extent, and, and not only that, but also restructured our military, keep that in mind, uh, and changed it in terms of what it practiced for, what it anticipated. And we also allowed, and I keep coming back to this notion uh, of giving, uh, forgetting that the Chinese were a hostile communist regime, a totalitarian regime, and treating it as though they were some sort of a France or Japan uh, coming and, and nesting in our society. I will remind you that during the Cold War, NATO COCOM restrictions, when I was beginning in this racket, and I started by working uh, for a consultancy that, that did Soviet weapon systems in, in the 80s, uh, you could not export some of the most basic PCs uh, to the Soviet Union because that was considered dual purpose technology. Uh, and I will never forget something I learned from a, a professor at Georgia Tech, who was a, a real scientist, not like me, so he could actually explain the science to me. And I will never forget when we're looking at the how the Russians reverse engineered the propulsion system for the Sidewinder missile. When he told me, Andrew, design is not that complicated. The Russians had the best mathematicians. They had the best software designers and writers. Look at you know the guy who co, co, uh, co uh, established Google, right? But their technology was crap. So they had to, even if they reverse engineered our designs, and that technology, by the way, as he told me, is in your processes, your alloys, your clean room, in the quality of your labor force. So imagine my, my surprise when all of a sudden we turned around and we handled our jewels. I don't mean just giving access to our universities and, and, and laboratories. But I mean, we literally took our processes and alloys and we placed it in China. And then we're surprised that one in five of Western companies doing business there has been extorted for intellectual property for market access. Uh, Boeing should not be building aircraft in China or Airbus. They can sell them to them, but that's a completely different conversation. So this brings me to where we are today. It is high time that the, the national governments set national security priorities and that the corporate interest understands that we're not shutting down trade, but there's a difference between creating a, a constricted centralized supply chain and a hostile power as opposed to creating regionally based diffuse supply chains where you have redundancies in countries that your allies and that in a crisis. And that finally, last point, uh, that when it comes to critical defense technology, autarky, even with the loss of efficiency, is absolutely imperative. Mm -hmm. We have forgotten all these lessons. So now we have an army that is too small, air force that is too small, all of our, all of our, our other forces, and we're looking not at one potential peer competitor, but at two major theater confrontations. While our allies in Europe, and I would love to hear what Sarah will say to that, are still unwilling to properly resource their defense to ensure that in the event of a crisis in the Indo-Pacific, they are not extorted by the Russians or worse. Uh, you know, there's a degree of unreality. If we don't invest in our national security, all the other issues, our form of government, our culture, our, our economy, will not be subject to our own fiat and will stop being free people. Can I just before, and Sarah, we'll definitely turn to you next, uh, but Andrew, just one quick follow up. Are you saying then um, that, however, uh, on the technological thing that the, the, the metaphor or sorry, the experience is similar to, to your early, earlier career experience during the Cold War, that in fact, uh, our lead is fine enough, and so we need to recommit a certain amount of budget, but you feel it's doable. And basically, as long as we shore up a lot of the sort of uh, intellectual stuff, we're, we're in okay shape. Is that, is that a fair characterization? I think it's going to be very hard. Hard decoupling from China will take time. It, it's going to be, I agree with Derek 100%, it's going to be very painful. And it's going to fail in some instances. But, you know, what I know is that if we continue to practice globalization as we have been, I know what the outcome is going to be. We will, the Chinese are not, the Chinese are being, uh, building a Navy, buying, uh, a, buying ports. Uh, they're establishing a, a supply chain across Eurasia that they want to protect with their weapon systems. That's the Belt and Road. That's the 17 plus one in Europe. If the Chinese are successful in doing this, they will not only change the distribution of economic and military power, but they will fundamentally reverse the relationship between maritime domain and land domain, something that has favored the West for the past 500 years, ever since you know ships got seaworthy. So we can do this. What, what is needed is a consensus. Mm. If, for example, if we do not agree with the Europeans 
that the Chinese are not just an economic problem, but that they're a fundamental threat to free democratic societies, then we will not be able to align our optics and we will not be able to compete. Yeah. So, so Sarah, uh, a lot there for you to unpack, uh, <laughs> sort of <laughs> Andrew's, Andrew's uh, gauntlet thrown on some of it, but also if I could also get you to uh, move the conversation in another direction, which is, um, so you study China. You're 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 a, 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 a accredited sinologist. So uh, can you can you <laughs> can you tell us? Um, you know, one of the things that I find uh, reading and grappling with a lot of this stuff in Washington is is uh, is a question of you know we're trying to set the goals, but there's less talk about how the Chinese are likely to react to this. What does this look like? Can you maybe game that out a little bit while addressing some of Andrew's points about Europe and the alliance structure? I think because both of those end up being kind of related. Oh, you're muted still. Sorry. Yeah, there I am again. Um, yeah, thank you, Andrew. Andrew and I have actually been having these types of conversations for some time. So <laughs> just picking up some strands from an ongoing uh, conversation. <laughs> well, um, I completely agree with Andrew in so far that we must uh, must uh, stop some of these loopholes that we have been uh, letting happen. And one example, one very practical example, is there have been, as a study by the Australian think tank ASPI has proven, uh, a steady flow of PLA officers, active PLA officers, posing as innocent graduate students studying high technology in the cutting edge fields in various Western countries, including, of course, Germany, which is a prime target for these types of activities. Never, of course, disclosing their actual affiliation. So this is an interesting piece that uh, came out of ASPI called uh, Picking Flowers, Making Honey, that I would highly recommend reading. And I can tell you that this came as absolute news to most people in Europe, I think, um, who never thought that this might be happening. So this is one of these examples, glaring examples of being absolutely careless about our own interests, about our own economic and military and security interests. Um, about the 2% goal, of course, I think this is what Andrew was referring to in terms of um, allies not will being willing to fund the militaries. There we are also in complete agreement. It's, of course, terrible that Europeans have have neglected this uh, so much for such a long time because the damage of neglect is so hard to repair. So it would probably take 10 years if you started a serious effort now to sort of uh, get back to a decent level of readiness and operational ability and capability. And the thing is, uh, what angers me when I, when I hear all these debates within Europe about the 2% NATO funding goal is um, that it, it a little bit misses a, a critical point because it is not really just a question of how much money you throw at the armed forces. It goes deeper than that. I just had a conversation with an, a colleague from Israel and we discovered during that conversation that Israel has roughly the sa same troop size as the German armed forces and the Israeli forces get about half the money in nominal terms that Germany puts out there for the armed forces. Um, so even though Germany pays uh, much less than NATO would like to see, rightfully, because we promised we would, um, still half that amount of money gets Israel to decently arm and train their forces and achieve a, a very impressive level of capability. And this is just one point to illustrate that what's lacking is not just money. We should definitely, of course, reach the 2% goal as quickly as possible. But our procurement system, unfortunately, is broken I would say, um, it's not just my opinion. And we need really to reform the whole system of recruitment, pro procurement. We need to sort of get our priorities right and what kind of capabilities really to develop. So um, this is really, um, while it's important to demand that allies keep what they promise and really do what they promise they will do, it's not enough. We actually need more than that. We need the actual commitment to, to create something that is 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 delivering on the capabilities that we need. So um, yeah, and that uh, is is one of the points where I think that we are losing um, the focus of what we want to achieve in the end. So we 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 are, we are entangled in this discussion, um, but the actual goal should be to achieve a decent capability. And um, yeah, it's not helpful to sort 
sort of uh, throw bad words at each other over that. It should maybe happen behind closed doors, but the out, uh, output should should be what matters. So Chinese reaction was your last uh, point. Yes, yes. Um, well, as a sinologist, I must say, um, my impression is, um, if you turn the tables and look at how China looks at the world, one must distinguish really what the Chinese Communist Party thinks about the world and the national you know, perception of China. And it's, it's very easy to conflate the two because the Chinese Communist Party actually tries to achieve that. They want to present to China and also to the rest of the world the idea that they speak for the Chinese people. And maybe we should not follow them so far. We should maybe make this distinction because actually we do not know what the Chinese people really want. They never get a chance to express their will. But um, when you look at what you see in writings of Chinese strategists, they seem very scared, actually. So our liberal Western values are perceived as a prime threat to the legitimacy and of the rule of the Communist Party. And they have skeletons in, in, the, in the closet. Uh, they know very well that if the Chinese public were aware how many people died in the Great Leap Forward, it must have been at least 35 million people. Uh, if, if, if it was known how little economic growth was, it, was achieved during the first three decades of communist rule, even though uh, it could have happened theoretically, if, for instance, Deng Xiaoping had taken over instead of Mao Zedong, we might have seen a, a much richer China in 1979 than we saw, actually saw. So the Communist Party has a lot to hide from its own people and is forever scared of, of uh, having their own people find out how much damage they really suffered. I, I've actually seen a transcript from a internal discussion inside the Beijing party school where one historian said, if they ever find out that we killed more people than the Japanese did in World War II, then they will rise up against us. They must never know this. So this is very striking to me, this fear of subversion of Western values being more attractive than that sort of system. And so from their point of view, it's all defensive. It's very funny if you talk to Chinese um, officials about why don't you join the INF Treaty? They say, um, well, our missiles are only for self-defense. It's <laughs> nothing the world needs to be concerned about. Of course, attacking Taiwan would also be, in their view, self-defense because of, you know, the threat of, of Taiwan undermining their rules. So this is really, really an interesting exercise to turn the tables and try and, and understand, if not, you know, if not uh, follow them there, but understand how they come to these conclusions. So what we need to think about is um, really the end goal. What do we want to achieve? What, how do we want China to behave? And how can we get them to do this? This is really the interesting question. And they're doing it the other way around. They're probing our weaknesses. They're trying to use incentives and threats and all these, all these things to, um, to get us to do what they want. Mm. And we should maybe think, how can we put out incentives of, of various kinds, including deterrence, military deterrence, but also positive incentives to change the behavior of China, to stop them bullying their weaker neighbors, to stop them from trying, you know, um, doing the things that we, we disapprove of. Mm. Uh, that's, that's terrific. And I think that is a point that gets lost very frequently in this. Derek, can you, can you uh, maybe run with that a little bit? Uh, we've now gone, uh, you know, twice around the group and, and um, you, you, were, you were pretty pessimistic about this. But I mean, I think we, we take Giselle's point to say that, you know, we, we, have, to, we have to reach for things and then see, see where we fall short. Talk a little bit. You mentioned you mentioned uh, Huawei, for example. You know, as the the economic thing. There's this proposal, the D10, that you know you get uh, democracies together and you start talking about uh, strategic uh, priorities and investment economically. How 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 hopeful are you about that? And especially taking uh, uh, what Sarah just said again, the the potential vulnerability that you know the legitimacy is historic and there are these skeletons in the closet but it's also economic the entire regime based its bases itself on on this so can you can you talk a little bit maybe uh about that well uh economics is a dismal science so i should clarify that i i don't think china is in very good shape at all but i'm still very pessimistic about our ability to respond in other words uh, somebody asked uh, an event like this a few weeks ago what I thought the future would hold. And I said, uh, you know, 
we're going to lose U.S. predominance, and the Chinese are not going to rise to replace it because they have too many problems. So that's that's an overview. But but trying to be more specific, you know, to say Huawei, Huawei has become the cause celebre in the U.S. Congress, where you know we just have to add Huawei to every single bill. We still haven't done anything. We are, it's always, we're going to give them another temporary general license, right? We found a loophole that was obvious the moment the Department of Commerce started speaking, and we're just now plugging it, only not now, it's going to be 90 days from now. But all of this is an exercise in stalling for the election, and really nothing I find the U.S. has done in the last couple of years has any credibility, because it's always in the future, and maybe in 2021, whoever's in charge, different cabinet members, et cetera, it'll have some credibility. So of course I understand the European position that America says you have to get Huawei out of your networks. And meanwhile, we have Huawei up on charges in federal court and we will not take economic action against them. Uh, we promise that we will, but we won't. I, I want to extend this so, so that we don't get obsessed with Huawei the way so much of Washington is. There are several bills being proposed now on a bipartisan basis in the Senate to subsidize uh, relocation of semiconductor production mm. or maintenance of semiconductor production and research in the United States. And I got into a screaming match with a U.S. Senator last week because, and this is bears on China, I was insisting that you, know, you can't freely allow allies to join this. They have to have some commitment to cutting the Chinese out of the supply chain for exactly the reason that you pose to question you posed to Sarah, the Chinese reaction in this particular case, and I see semiconductors as the heart of the competition in many ways, will be to outsubsidize us. And until you get somebody committing that, I don't care who has the best subsidy. Until they say, oh, I, you know, the economic opportunity in China has improved, I have to rethink this. Until they renounce that, we're not going to win this battle. And this gets to your question. We're not going to outsubsidize the Chinese. We're not set up that way, thankfully. Um, so we're going to need commitment within the U.S., which we do not have, and then from our allies, our key technology allies, the the British, the Dutch, the Germans, the Japanese, the Israelis, are you know only a hand Taiwanese, Koreans to say, yeah, the Chinese are going to make this better for you to keep key technology supply chains in China or to relocate them in China. They're going to offer you more money, and you have to be willing to say no. And until we have that here and from our friends, it's not going to work. Right? It doesn't matter where the opportunity is, you have to say no. And this repeats you know, Andrew's more general point, um, but, but we don't have that here, which is why I'm pessimistic. We can't really legitimately go to Sarah and other people in Europe who, are, who see China similar to the way I see it and say, well, you, know, you need to do X, Y, and Z because the United States hasn't done those things. We've talked about them, but we haven't done them. And this is a senator proposing a bill aimed at China who doesn't really want to have law backing the bill. He thinks we can spend $25 billion and the Chinese won't spend $26 billion. Uh, yeah, that's all, all very good points. I, so we're, we're coming up uh, on, on the hour here. So let's maybe then go like this. Uh, Giselle, why don't you start us off here? And we don't know what the elections are going to look like five months away. Um, but again, uh, maybe you can talk about Having thought about, uh, you know, it's been almost a month since you wrote the piece. Have you thought about priorities, about, you know, if one were to start unpacking this, how would one even start sequencing and thinking about this? Taking Derek's, uh, I think, very well taken uh, criticisms and, you know, just questions about political economy. How would you go about this? How would you advise uh, either, uh, you know, an incoming Biden administration or, or a, um, you know, part two of Donald Trump, uh, if, if that's what it ends up being. How do you approach something like this? Well, okay, I would say two things, um, I, which will probably tell you more about my prejudices than about what where wisdom lies, but, but nonetheless. First of all, having an actual conversation about the strategy and trade-offs and I mean, Derek's last point I thought was sort of could be more generally replied. We're getting defeated in detail, so to speak, by all the things that require individual sacrifice. Um, you know that that is to play into Chinese hands to to a certain degree. So by making, you know, I sound like Donald Roosevelt, but by making the problem bigger, we might get closer to a solution. And I, again, I would just get back to the idea that, that military and security steps are, uh, you know, sort of need 
to lead the way. They are an expression of national. I, I don't really agree with Derek that um, that there isn't money available. Uh, <laughs> you know, if we just look at the actions of our government in the last four months, uh, you know, um, and as nice as it would be to uh, uh, reform entitlements, even as a 67 year old. That uh, you know, we can't really. I don't think we need to can allow that to be um, uh, a, that kind of a problem because the difference between what we're already spending and what an adequate amount would be uh, isn't really is a drop in the bucket. So if 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 there actually were a Pacific pivot to go back to the. Uh, uh, and there was at least some sort of recommitment to a global posture. Um, I think that would have an effect beyond, uh, you know, I think that it might, might jumpstart this process. And again, it would shift the ground of the conversation towards security and strategy and away from the difficulties of sacrificing economically, uh, and all of the things that are individually extremely hard to do. And unless there is a security and strategy framework for talking about these other questions, I think it would be very hard to uh, reverse the trend. So mm. not that the, you know, when AOC becomes national security advisor, I doubt I'll get an, entry, an invitation to the White House. But if she does, that's what I got for her. <laughs> Andrew, um, I, Arturo Lopez Levy on YouTube says, and I'm going to paraphrase the question a little bit, but uh, he says, you know, what, what can the U U.S. do? You know, maybe he, he, he throws out their sort of sanctions uh, as, a, as a coercive method for getting allies online. I don't know how you feel about that. That seems a bit much to me, but uh, how, do you, how, do, how, do we, how do we start, uh, you know, call it herding cats, if, uh, if you will? You know, how do you, how do you line up the incentives to get this right? So um, I think we've gone through a series of, of conversations of that kind with our German friends on Nord Stream 2 and sanctions and, and all of that. Look, in the final analysis, this is a European decision point. Either the Europeans believe that being part of the larger transatlantic community because of their values, their institutions, their culture, and everything else that goes with it uh, is, in the final analysis, more important. Uh, and therefore, they take the steps that are necessary to remain this, this gateway for the transatlantic community into Eurasia and to become and to remain part of this of this larger transatlantic community, or they will not. They have a decision point. Uh, we were talking earlier with Sarah, you know, the German Bundestag will have uh, its Foreign Affairs uh, Committee meeting next Monday on China, on Huawei. Uh, I, I believe it's a public meeting. And I think going forward, this will be a fundamental uh, discussion. Um, from what I would answer to, to that question would, would be this. It really requires uh, articulating first and foremost the vision. Uh, and the, here the burden is on, on our leaders a, across the par partisan lines and across governments in Europe as to what, what we want this world to look like in the next 10 or 15 years. Because if we stay in the same mode, unless we rethink and gut, drop basically, what is meant by globalization, then we will not then we will not come out of this in a good shape and we will all be net losers because the europeans will become the tail end of the chinese supply system running across eurasia and we will be pushed to the edge of the western pacific and most likely out out of out of western atlantic and what uh, out of the atlantic and what what the uh, what the russians do in the process it's a separate conversation so the europeans have a decision to make and we have a decision to make and when i say we have a decision to make I think it's way past the time where the conversation about national security priorities takes, you know, second place uh, in Washington and, and across, across our policy community. Uh, when I first wrote the piece for, for the American interest, uh, and I said, we need hard decoupling from China, I was stunned how many people came up to me and said, that's not going to happen. That's just irrational. That's just, 
And I kept asking why. Well, it's because it's just irrational. Uh, look, we have allowed for companies and for, for decision makers and our policy elites, and I'm going to use the P word, uh, to not think first and foremost in terms of what I call patriotic, patriotic, patriotic responsibility. That there's a certain commitment and duty. You lead by taking care of your nation and of your people. And, you know, if, if, you're, if you're an American and you're sitting on the board of a Chinese company that is owned by the People's Liberation Army, what is your fiduciary responsibility? Your responsibility is to the stakeholder. You know, in what capacity are you making those decisions? I think we need to get national security priorities front and center, and we need to start asking questions about where we locate our most sensitive supply chains. And again, when I say reshoring the Japanese, I believe Derek knows this better than I do, announced about 2.2 billion in government assistance to reshore about 30% of, of Japanese manufacturing out of China. They're not getting out of China altogether, but they're looking at the critical components that they need to get. And there's a difference between locating your supply chain, say, in, in Europe, even in the Balkans or, or, or in the European Union, or in friendly you know, democratic states in Asia, then pumping all that money and all those resources into a country that's intent on confronting you. This should be the priority conversation for us. Sarah, let me then ask you, uh, if... Uh, we do have a Biden administration. Uh, you know, Trump has, I think, uh, changed the dialogue on China, uh, but also, you know, damaged the transatlantic relationship in many ways, at least from the European perspective, uh, as you mentioned several times. Can you can you say um, can you speculate a little bit about if a Biden administration comes in, uh, what can what will have changed and, and can can there be sort of forward movement still uh, on on these questions of of uh, uh, collective security and, and defense spending or will Europeans then say ah well now finally we have we have a, a Democrat that we understand and we can uh, we can sort of go back to how has something changed fundamentally after four years of Trump and that that there's a fire under on in the belly of Europe hey, you might mute mute again unmute Sorry, um, definitely something has changed. So if, if Trump's, uh, President Trump's um, rhetoric style has achieved one thing, it's certainly to have woken people up. And uh, one, one sentence I heard very often at the beginning of the Trump administration was, we are on our own now. So this, this sense of, oh my God, we might be abandoned and have to fight, fend for ourselves, that was very overwhelming. So now it has, uh, I think it boils down to the fact that many Europeans have realized over these past couple of years that while a Biden administration will probably be more pleasant to deal with in style, this is not really a matter of substance so much because the consensus in America regarding China, I think it, it, it's, it's, it's bipartisan actually, mostly. So many of the things that uh, the Trump administration has done regarding China would probably just be continued. And uh, I think Europeans are beginning to realize that. So it's not just a matter of this one administration. There's a fundamental uh, American interest in containing some of the things that China is doing and in deterring China from escalating militarily, for instance, in the Western Pacific. And Europeans are beginning to understand that. So I, I'm not as pessimistic as Andrew in that sense. My personal experience has been in the past couple of years that there has been a massive shift of awareness. It, it doesn't happen overnight, Andrew, you know, people need a, a little bit of time to adjust their, their knowledge of, of facts in the world. And China has done a lot to help that, to be fair. I mean, COVID yes. alone has certainly shown people a lot of things about China that they maybe were in denial before. But even before COVID, uh, many of the threatening actions, the wolf warrior diplomacy style, for instance, of, of Chinese diplomats all across Europe, has also shown people a different face than China has shown Europe before. So I think this process is happening. I think there is a heightened sense of security awareness. The problem is um, it needs to happen quite quickly. We need 
we need to kind of do the work that should maybe be done across 10 years time, need to do it very quickly. And it can be difficult just to, you know, um, to, to get your act together. So what I think um, is, is positive, uh, if a Biden administration came into power, what the positive thing might be that Europeans would sigh a collective sigh of relief and say, oh, finally, we have a, we have someone who's more European in their style that we can maybe communicate easier with, but they would discover very quickly and they know it already, I think, that in, in substance nothing much would change and they have still have to do all these changes. Derek, final question will go to you and it is actually uh, from one of our uh, watchers, listeners, Adam O'Neill, who might be the Adam O'Neill who works for the Wall Street Journal, but I don't know. <laughs> in any case, he asks, um, uh, who do you think the CCP prefers to win in November, Biden or Trump? And the reason I ask that uh, is... Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, 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 the reason I ask that also, and maybe you can, you know, to wrap us up, because I, I think, you know, your criticism uh, and your, your pushback, I think, is, is well taken, that there isn't a consensus domestically in the United States yet, according to you. Uh, so this is, runs a little bit counter to what Sarah is saying, that the Europeans see that there is a bipartisan consensus, and you see it as perhaps a shallow consensus that something must be done, but no one really wants to do anything about it. Uh, so, you know, take that question or not about the CCP, but, but also tell us a little bit about what needs to happen, you think, for the United States to actually develop a consensus. What kind of shock would need to happen that we can start implementing some of, you know, Giselle's broader vision and actually get some traction for this sort of stuff? Uh, well, I'll continue to be pessimistic. Uh, I don't think President Trump is capable of leading such a, a, a consolidation of U.S. opinion because he's too divisive on other issues and because of his style and because of his praising of Xi Jinping that Sarah mentioned earlier, which I find revolting. Um, I don't think Vice President Biden, if he wins, is capable either. And I, I you know, the energy level you know, we're supposed to get something comprehensive on China from the Biden campaign, and they don't want to do it because it's more trouble than it's worth. Uh, from what I know in the campaign, which is not much, there are people, you know, there are considerable disagreements within the campaign, just there are, as there are within the Trump administration. Um, so I think we're going to we're going to be relying on less on who's president. Uh, I will be I would be very interested in seeing the cabinet makeup. I think that will be important. Uh, in 2021 regardless, because if it's President Trump, he will not be running for re-election, so he'll probably not be interfering constantly. If it's Vice President Biden, I'm not sure he's going to run for re-election. Um, so I think the cabinet members could have more uh, role, um, and I you know, don't know who those are, but if, if we had time, I would speculate on it. Um, however, I, I think the drive is going to come, as Sarah just said, from China, meaning that if the U.S. is going to unify, if Europe is going to unify, um, on the China issue, our best friend here is Xi Jinping. He will not fail to continue to be a cult of personality, utterly intolerant dictator. You can't say I'm, I look like Winnie the Pooh and we're not gonna share data on COVID. We go everywhere from trivial to crucial and, and this, you know, we're, we're dealing with uh, somebody who you know, may not be the worst dictator in the world, but the combination of power and his own uh, personal inclinations, he is going to create the unity in the U.S. and Europe over time uh, that we need. It's not going to be done, at least being in Washington, uh, by the Democratic or Republican parties. Everyone, thank you so much. Uh, we've gone a little bit over an hour. Thank you for, for indulging me and indulging us. Uh, this has been terrific, and hopefully we can, uh, we can, we can definitely do a, a part two at some point as, uh, as, as the elections approach, at least. Thanks. Right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. <laughs> Bye.